dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. And I'm Lydia Murray. We are editors at Dance Media, and today we'll get started with a headline rundown that features a lawsuit against a major modern dance company, Dance World Reactions to Jennifer Homan's just-published biography of George Balanchine, and Playbill's departure from Twitter. And then we'll talk about two recent interviews with the generally kind of interview shy Mikhail Baryshnikov, who had interesting things to say about the role of art in a time of war, the future of ballet in Russia and Ukraine, and how he feels about the state of ballet more generally. First, though, I hope you've all been able to listen to our new long-form interview episodes, which are now alternating with these headline rundown episodes. They're coming out every other Thursday. Last week, we had just the best interview with the choreographer and dancer and actor and musician, Tony Basil, an icon if ever there were one. Next week, actually on Wednesday, one day early since it's Thanksgiving week. So next Wednesday, we'll have a special conversation with current ballet Hispanico leader Eduardo Villaro, and then the company's former longtime executive director, Verdery Roosevelt. And they talk about how they're maintaining and building on the legacy of company founder Tina Ramirez, another absolute dance legend who recently passed away. I hope you can tune in for that. And if you're enjoying the new format, by the way, please do take a minute to leave us a rating or a review on your listening platform of choice, because we really appreciate all of your feedback. Truly, we do. All right, now let's get started on this not all that long, but rather substantial headline rundown list. A costume designer has filed a lawsuit against the Paul Taylor Dance Company, alleging that the company discriminated against her because she is a mother. Yeah. We have a link to the New York Times report on that in the show notes, a complicated one. Over in the ballet world, historian and critic Jennifer Homan's long-awaited book about George Balanchine called Mr. B, George Balanchine's 20th Century, just came out. As expected, it has sparked a lot of conversation. There have been reviews aplenty. Uh, most have noted that while Homan's is certainly an ardent Balanchine admirer, the book is not a hagiography. It is pretty candid about Balanchine's cruelty, especially toward the women in his company. Full disclosure here, I'm about halfway through this book myself. My first impressions were that, wow, it features a staggering amount of research, first of all, and, and some truly beautiful writing about Balanchine's ballets. But yeah, you also definitely feel the tension between her reverence for Balanchine's art and then her descriptions of his failings as a person. Anyway, that kind of contextualization is always complicated, but the book is worth reading, and so is a lot of the coverage about it, some of which we have linked to in the show notes. Bob Fosse's Dancing is set to return to Broadway next year. Performances will begin March 2nd, 2023, and opening night is scheduled for March 19th. The production will recreate Fosse's original Tony-winning choreography, and Tony winner and Dancing original Broadway cast member Wayne Salento is directing and providing musical staging. I'm so glad that's coming to New York City. I'm hoping a lot of the cast from that Old Globe production transfers too, because I was such a great group of dancers, Ida Saki and Colton Krauss and Corey Michelle Petinot. It's like all stars. Agreed. Really great group of dancers. In more Broadway news, Broadway transfer news, Shucked, a corn-themed musical comedy, is coming to the Nederlander Theater in March following its world premiere at Utah's Pioneer Theater Company. Shucked features choreography by Sarah Oglebi, who, by the way, also choreographed the new musical version of Almost Famous. Playbill has left Twitter, saying that the platform now blurs actual news and insidious rhetoric. The move comes after Twitter launched and then shortly thereafter suspended a program that allowed users to pay for a verification checkmark, which led to confusion and misinformation. Will we see more of these kinds of announcements from more arts organizations as time goes on? Maybe. Quite possibly. Weird time to be on Twitter. Next up on the rundown, Dance Data Project recently released a study looking at compensation for the artistic and executive directors of the largest 50 ballet and classically based companies in the U.S. And it found that during fiscal year 2020, those companies' budgets dropped by an average of 9%, but executive and artistic director salaries actually increased. So information about fiscal year 2021 is not yet available, but it will be interesting to see how that year's 
data looks. What happens to budgets and compensation as companies restarted live performances? The full report does have information about 2016 to 2019, as well as 2020. So it's tons of useful info, and we've linked to it in the show notes. Lester McGrath, the executive director of the Royal New Zealand Ballet, has quit effective immediately. The company cited personal and career reassessment reasons in its recent announcement of McGrath's resignation. According to the statement, board chairperson Dame Carrie Prendergast would take over his duties effective immediately. Sort of a strange moment for this company, because that resignation announcement was sent just a few hours before it put out its big press release about its 70th anniversary season next year. And then that release didn't mention McGrath at all, which is kind of mysterious. And then there's also been some other turbulence at the company recently. Um, we have a link to a story about the Lester McGrath news that does a good job sort of summing up the broader context in the show notes. Happier news now, out of Pacific Northwest Ballet, the company has promoted six standout dancers to soloist. So congratulations to Madison Ray Nabeo, Damiel Cruz Garrido, Christopher Dariano, Amanda Morgan, Christian Poppy, and Leah Tirada. That's a much-needed bright spot on this list. Absolutely. Very well-deserved and exciting promotions. Yeah. And for a not-so-bright spot, uh, Len Goodman is leaving the ballroom. The Dancing with the Stars head judge has announced his upcoming retirement from the show. Goodman was a judge on Strictly Come Dancing, which is a British version of Dancing with the Stars, uh, before he joined the U.S.-based show when it began in 2005. And next week will be his final night of judging. End of an era. End of an era, indeed. In dance science news, a recent study published in the journal Current Biology found that very low frequency vibrations, like low enough that they are inaudible to humans, actually make people dance more. So how did the researchers figure that out? Well, during a live EDM concert, they turned a speaker emitting those types of super low vibrations on and off, and then they measured how much concert goers danced using motion capture headsets. It's pretty wild that music you can't even hear can make you want to dance. Or actually, as NPR of all places put it, it really is all about that bass. NPR getting its New York Post on. Indeed. <laughs> and um, the dance world has lost two very important figures. DC hand dance legend Lawrence Bradford died on September 26th, age 78. DC hand dance is the fluid swing dance that is the official dance of the District of Columbia. In 1992, he founded Smooth and Easy Hand Dance Institute, a school that would specialize in the dance style. And there he taught roughly 15,000 students to dance. Uh, we have also lost Joan Peters. She was one of only three people approved by Catherine Dunham as a certified master teacher, and she was the chairperson for Dunham Technique at the Ailey School for 44 years. Peters also taught at the Ailey Extension and at Ailey's former program for the blind and visually impaired and the class for deaf preschool and grade school students. And both will be missed. Yeah. That's the end of our headline rundown this episode, but please also be sure to check out the Dance Media Events Calendar because it has a lot more information about upcoming performances and especially auditions um, and also other Dance World events we just don't maybe have time to get to here on the podcast. So to see the full list and add your own events to it, head to dancemediacalendar.com. All right, moving on now to our longer discussion segment, which we're doing a little bit differently this episode. Rather than focusing on a particular topic that's been in the news, we're going to talk about two recent interviews with one of dance's biggest stars. So yesterday, the day you're hearing this, it'll be yesterday, Mikhail Baryshnikov received the Queen Elizabeth II Coronation Award from the UK's Royal Academy of Dance. That's RAD's highest honor. And in the days leading up to the ceremony, Baryshnikov talked to our own Amy Brandt at Point Magazine, and also to The Guardian's Lindsay Winship. And both interviews were pretty wide-ranging. When an artist of this stature is receiving this type of Lifetime Achievement Award, there are always a lot of possible topics on the table. But there were a few common themes. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, what the war is doing to the ballet community, 
what continues to inspire him and how he thinks ballet has changed or rather has not changed during his lifetime. For the point story, Amy was so generous and gave us all an opportunity to help give our, our thoughts about what we should ask for this story. The question of the role that art and artists can play in times of crisis was an important one. Even though he's so respected, it still takes a lot of courage to speak against the Putin regime. Uh, and it's been great to see him vocally supporting dancers who are taking a stand. And as he mentioned in the Guardian article, when he defected uh, from to, to Canada from the USSR in 1974, he viewed it as primarily an artistic choice. Uh, and that's kind of what's facing, I think, a lot of dancers right now. You want to further your career, obviously. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're not supporting injustice. Uh, so that was interesting. Yeah, I think we I think we talked on the podcast before about the earlier exchange between Borishnikov and Alexei Ratmansky, who had at least initially some some differences of opinion about like what should be expected of artists during wartime. Um, back in March, Borishnikov had said that he didn't think Russian artists should be punished for failing to speak out against Putin. Ratmansky had sort of pushed back saying, no, there's no excuse for not actively opposing the war. In these two more recent interviews, Borishnikov sort of, yeah, he sort of addressed the idea a little bit obliquely. He mentioned the extraordinary courage it takes to speak up. And then sort of in the same breath also quoted Alexei Navalny's call for all good people to take action against evil. There's a lot of subtlety. There's a lot of nuanced his positions on these ideas, which you know makes sense. He's an incredibly thoughtful artist. Um, I also thought his comments about the future of ballet in Ukraine and Russia were interesting. In the Point interview, he expressed a lot of hope that this terrible war will ultimately invigorate the arts in Ukraine, that it might lead to a great renaissance of Ukrainian ballet. And then for Russia, he painted a much bleaker picture, saying that ballet will, quote, need to be entirely reborn and rebuilt from the ground up figuratively and literally, end quote. Oof, heavy stuff. Yes. And also, it was interesting just to hear him speak a bit about dancers who are looking toward the future of their careers, the perspective that they can have. And he mentioned, you know, that there's still so much work to be done in whatever capacity it feels right to you. Um, some might you know, continue by going into arts management or by even just being an audience member. And that's true. I mean, there's always something to contribute. And he, of course, has done so much. He's had such an incredible career and he has such a well-rounded, unique perspective on what it means to have the next chapter of your career as a dancer and how many possibilities there are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting because in The Guardian, Lindsay Winship asked him a question about how he'd seen ballet change since he came to the West, since he defected. And he actually said, besides the level of technique, which has jumped ahead by leaps and bounds, he didn't think it had changed much, which didn't necessarily sound like an indictment in context, but like saying it out loud here, it doesn't feel great. It seems like Bershnikov's own interests have shifted away from ballet and outward in other directions. And that does make me wonder about how he sees the future of ballet itself. Um, and may, you know, maybe those kinds of statements are more reflections of a personal shift in perspective than anything else. But like selfishly, I, I want him in ballet's corner still, you know? Um, but I guess sort of on a, on a happier note, and to come back to what you were saying about the advice he was giving to, to dancers that he was giving in point to dancers who might be looking to other aspects of their career beyond performance or beyond ballet. I liked his quote on a similar note in The Guardian, where he was talking about why he's still excited even today to explore unfamiliar artistic territory, about how he's this continual like restlessness is what still drives him as an artist. So he said, quote, I like to put myself in vulnerable positions artistically. It's exhilarating to try and overcome the natural insecurity and fear that comes with each new project. Chasing that unknown and finding a way to make it work keeps me focused and happy, actually, unquote. And like as somebody who has a hard time pushing herself to chase unknowns, like I want to print that out and tape it to my fridge, you know? <laughs> I thought the same thing. I'm sure that's 
obviously never easy and by definition if you're if you're constantly putting yourself in vulnerable positions i i'm sure in some way it, it's when you have so much success in your past you know maybe that can help you to have maybe a little bit more confidence in your ability to do something you know something that's a little bit of a stretch for you or something that's new for you but it's still so interesting to hear someone who's at that level talk a bit about how they continue to challenge themselves and uh, and how they continue to to grow and um, to lean into that fear. I mean, everyone at every level of their career, I think, can have that sort of fear or insecurity and how you cope with it and how you, whether you lean into it or whether you kind of back away from it is critical. And it's really interesting. So that was interesting to hear him kind of mention. Yeah, yeah. Leaning into fear, finding courage, I guess, is re- was really the through line to both both interviews, um, to all of his answers. Both the Point interview and the Guardian interview are, of course, worth reading. And, of course, we have linked them both for you in the show notes. All right, that's it for us this week. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll be back in two weeks for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Bye, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Amy Brandt, Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.